last week, throughout this week, I guess, because of the way the days have fallen, the 4th of July, uh, you know, um, holiday is still upon us. We kind of started last week, and, and I spoke a message about freedom, and uh, that will be airing, probably already aired today um, on television. And uh, we talked about the various different kinds of freedom that we have in Christ. And, you know, I was watching a, a movie uh, yesterday about the life of George Washington. And uh, what an unbelievable Christian he was. And it was, uh, America was founded on many peoples, but very especially on his faith and on his prayer. And do not believe the revision uh, is version of George Washington's life. And people will say he was not really a Christian and he, was, he had all these differing beliefs and he was members of this and members of that. Of course, that's what the enemy will do is steal uh, the truth and mix it up in a bunch of things that it wasn't so that we don't think that our founding fathers of this country were men of God. But I want to tell you, George Washington was an unbelievable man of God. Not only was he an incredible man of God, but he stood for America before America existed in the same way that the Bible tells us that Abraham is the father of our faith. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The covenant of God, the promise of God was made with Abraham. It was through Abraham that Jesus actually came to be. And as George Washington was called upon by God to not only fight in, in the uh, army and, uh, and, and in the armed forces and all the things that were happening at that time as America was beginning to get formed. At some point, he gets called to be president, the very first president of the United States. It had never been done before. Uh, they, made, they made a point that they didn't quite know what to do. So they held open a Bible and, he, and they swore him in on a Bible. And that was just a spur of the moment idea. How do you become a president? Well, let's do this. So that was, that was day one. And the very first thing that he did as the very first president in the actual, you know, written record of the happenings of the United States of America day one in the 1700s is he made a covenant with God and all of Congress and everybody with him. As soon as he made that declaration politically, he walked the entire Congress across the street and down the way to a church. And they entered that church and they fell to their knees and they prayed and bent, went before God and this was the covenant that they made at the altar, that for as long as this country would maintain that Jesus Christ is Lord in this land and over this land, that God's covenant of blessing would be upon America. They believed America was the new Jerusalem. They believed America was the fulfillment of the Bible to take them out of the systems of the world and give them a fresh start, brave new world. And we all know how that went. And where it is today, I'm sure, is unrecognizable from those early days. And the Bible says, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Amen? And yet, I would say that in our world today, God being the Lord is the last thing from most people's minds. However, through over, throughout time, from the very first day of the birth of our country, the one thing that has been a constant truth is that the church of Jesus Christ has always prevailed. It has always lasted. And it has always changed and formed and forged every generation. Lately, not so much, but in those early decades and centuries, the Bible was central. It was our curriculum for, to learn English. It was our laws hanging in every court of law. 
It was the Bible. The entire country was built upon the Bible. Don't let anyone ever change that in your mind or in your children's mind, because I will tell you right now, your children right here in our city is, are not being taught that. They have a completely different version of history. So we as parents have to take responsibility and teach our children what actually happened, which means you might have to do a little research and get some material to help uh, teach that, and I'd be happy to find that for you if you can't find it. But do you understand what I'm saying? Like, this is happening in our day right now that, that our children are being taught a completely different version of America. But America was known by its faith and for its faith, and God used America over centuries. Were there sins? Oh, many, many, many. But has God's hand of blessing been on this country? Undeniably. Undeniably. But the one thing that has remained the same, as I said, has been the freedom of those who have found freedom in Christ. And when we gather together, we call ourselves a church. And we are in little towns, on dusty streets, or in big cities, in, in city centers, or in community centers, or in school gymnasiums, or in beautiful buildings and edifices, or movie theaters, or wherever, people who call themselves Christians gather together. And the church not only has survived throughout the ages of this country and the, its entire lifetime, but even now as I speak, the church is thriving like never before because people are hungry for freedom real freedom, not the kind that we think politics can give us. In fact, I don't know any sane person who actually thinks any political system can bring us freedom. And as a matter of fact, it brings us pretty much the opposite. But I'm saying all that today is because the Bible talks so much about freedom. And in the book of Galatians, the people in that town were being um, coerced by other people to go back to the old way of doing religious life. You gotta remember that the Jews had worshiped God in a certain way for thousands of years. Now all of a sudden there's this new way to worship God. There's a new covenant, there's a new testament, there's a new savior, it's all new. They don't know what to do. How do we, be, how, how do we act as a Christian where five minutes ago we were Jewish? Do you understand how they might have felt? Very similar to to the beginning of this country. They didn't quite know how to, how to do it, but they just one step in front of them and they prayed their way through everything. Talking about George Washington, most of the portraits of George Washington are not of him in battle, but they are of him on his knees in prayer. There are many, many different versions of, of a praying uh, first president, asking God for his deliverance in many multiple battles and so on. And today we are still praying and we are still standing before God and we are still believing God for the freedom that comes in Christ. I don't look for political freedom. I look for freedom in the hearts of every man, every woman, every boy, and every girl who will come to the cross of Jesus, who will say, Jesus, I need a savior. Will you save me? And Jesus says, yes, I have come to seek and to save that which was lost. And all of a sudden, a person who was lost and floundering and going nowhere and under the, under the, the or within the prison of all kinds of things in their lives, suddenly freedom comes to them and the prison doors open and the deaf hear and the blind see and the lame walk and our lives are put back together because a loving God crashes into our darkness and brings us into a place of freedom that can only be experienced from the inside out. There is no freedom from the outside in. It's always from the inside out. And no one can take the freedom that Christ has given to each of those who have sworn by his name. Amen. In fact, the Bible says, not only have you known the name of Jesus as your Savior, but the Bible promises that he has called you by your name. And we have this great relationship of freedom in Christ. And yet, I believe as Christians, we can easily get lulled into believing the, uh, the cultural line of thinking and how everything is, is godless and, and, and we can actually buy into some of that and begin to be despondent or discouraged. 
And last week, as we talked about the topic of freedom, we talked about how Christ has given us the ability to have freedom from our past. And I don't know about you, but that's a super big one for me. I am so glad that Jesus, you know, disconnected me from my past. He came into my darkest, worst moment in his mercy and his grace, and he scooped me up, and, and he brought me into, uh, uh, into a place in my life where, where I could actually walk out of all of that and into an amazing life. And I want to thank him again for those days that he rescued me from. Has anybody been rescued? If you've never been rescued, then you have no idea what I'm talking about. But if Jesus ever came into your life in a way that set you free, you would know it. And so it is about that freedom that I want to share one more aspect of which the Bible talks an awful lot about this kind of freedom. And it is the freedom from unforgiveness. The freedom from unforgiveness. These are always matters of the heart. It's never the without, it's the within things that will either promote us and bring us closer to Jesus in our life or will hold us back and keep us from really being all that God has called us to be. The image that you have of yourself is based so much on what has happened to you, who's done what to you, what you survived, what you went through, what kind of abuse did you experience in your life? What did people say? How did people try to tear you down? What kind of labels and names were placed upon you throughout various stages of your life until you get to this moment in life, whatever that is for you? And dealing with all of that hurt and rejection and all of that stuff that, that gets stuffed down in our life, to have true freedom in our life, we have to be able to take all of that stuff and bury it at the foot of the cross and not let it survive or have one more day of, of airtime in our life. We have to be able to silence the voice of the people and the situations that occurred and happened in our life to hurt us. So how do we do that? And today is about how to do that. And how we do that is we learn the biblical principle of forgiveness. And so in 3 John chapter 1 and verse 2, the Bible says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health, even as your soul prospers. And I want you to just think about this term soul. If your soul is healthy and whole, you will be healthy physically, emotionally, spiritually, and your life will be prospering. Your life will be flourishing. Your life will be thriving. Now, you may not have every single thing perfect, but that doesn't matter to you because you are at peace with God, at peace with yourself, and you know that, you know, you're not where you're going to be, but thank God you're not where you were. Do you understand what I'm saying? the process of living your life out with, with the hand of God on your life. There's nothing like that life. That's the best life you can live is living the life that Jesus Christ has for you. His version of your life is way better than your version of your life. Amen. And I know that from personal experience. But as we look at this tiny verse, it reminds us that our soul can be sick. We can have a sick soul. We can have a soul that is not prospering, is not well. And when our soul is sick, what does it matter if we have physical health or financial blessing in our life? If we have sick souls, we'll never enjoy it. We will push people away. We'll push success away. We'll, we'll push joy away because that's what a sick soul does. And many of us have a hole in our soul. But God wants your soul to be whole. There's a W in there. Did anybody follow what I just said? I don't know. I can barely make it out myself. There's an H-O-L-E in our soul that is an open door for the enemy to rob you from God's best. In your marriage as a husband, as a wife, as a parent. In your life as you go through life with friends coming and going. Friends that, 
that you think will always be your friends. And the younger you are, the more you believe that. Until you leave school and you have no idea who those people even were that you were forced to be friends with. And now you actually get to choose some friends. It's a much better thing. But all these relationships that we have in our life, if our soul is broken, we will experience that and we won't receive. We won't walk in the freedom that Christ has purchased for us. So God wants your soul to be healed, to be whole, and to be well. And in order for that to happen, the Bible is full of the recipe to get your soul healed. In Ephesians chapter 4, we'll start there, verse 31. The Bible tells us to get rid of all bitterness, of all rage and anger. Everything I'm reading are symptoms of a broken soul. All bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander. That's speaking evil of people. Along with every kind of malice. The Bible's saying, get rid of all of that. In, instead of that, be kind and compassionate to one another. And do what? <laughs> Forgiving each other, just as Christ God forgave you. Amen. Well, that's a tough pill to swallow, isn't it? Because we all believe we deserve forgiveness. It's just the people that have done us wrong that don't deserve forgiveness. And sometimes... It's some really bad stuff that people have done and you have no intention of forgiving them. But if you don't forgive them, they continue to hurt you. They continue to have a voice in your life. And the only way you're going to shut their voice out, the only way they're going to stop the control of those who sought to hurt you in the first place is for you to begin to allow the word of God to free you from the past and from everything anyone's ever done. Let's look at Colossians chapter 3 verse 13. Bear with one another. That means be patient with one another. Boy, if we just tried that at home, wouldn't that change our relationships with our parents and our kids and, our, and each other, one another? Bear with, have patience with each other. And do what? Forgive one another. If any of you have a grievance against somebody, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Again, we hear this echoing, the Lord has forgiven you. He has given you freedom. Now you must do the same for others in your life. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says some very, very powerful words. He says, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Don't you think that's a pretty strong thing to say? Your Father will not forgive your sins. In fact, there's even a place for us husbands in the, I believe the first or second book of Peter, where the Bible tells us that if we aren't right with our wives, that God will not even hear our prayers. So I got to get it right with her before I can get it right with him. If you're married today, you better listen to that scripture. There are very few scriptures as specific as that when it comes to married life. You better have it right with your wife before you go to heaven. And I, I mean, not physically go to heaven, but before you, before you want to get your prayers answered. So there is a time when prayers don't get answered. There is a time when forgiveness is not given if forgiveness is not coming from you to those who have hurt you in your life. So then Jesus goes on and he tells this story in Matthew 18, which I won't read to you, but just to give you the highlights of it. And uh, it, it illustrates the importance of forgiveness. And it's about a servant who was forgiven a massive debt by his master. But he turns around and refuses to forgive uh, a fellow servant a very small debt. This doesn't make sense. The master, upon hearing this, what does he do? He revokes his forgiveness and punishes the servant. The story emphasizes that we must forgive others as God has forgiven us, not only to receive forgiveness ourselves, but to live free from the burdens of bitterness and resentment. So important that you don't let those things stay in your life. 
So there's a couple of takeaways that we can receive from this. One is forgiveness releases you. Always remember today when you forgive somebody, it really isn't for them and you don't have to be in front of them to forgive them. Forgiveness happens in your heart, not a showdown. I'm not a big believer in having a big showdown, a big come to Jesus with your enemy and, 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 you know, duking it out. I don't think that that's intelligent at all. But forgiveness has to begin in your heart. Once forgiveness has happened in your heart, it begins to naturally work itself out in life. But holding on to unforgiveness is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to suffer. It keeps you trapped in a cycle of pain. By forgiving, you release yourself from the emotional and spiritual bondage of bitterness and anger. If there's anger in your heart, if there's rage going on inside of you, it's because you're suffering with a broken soul. You're dealing with perhaps not being able to forgive people that hurt you. And again, those hurts can be devastating beyond imagination, things we could never say in public. And they can, they can be things that change the trajectory of your life unless you accept freedom in Jesus Christ. But by accepting G freedom in Jesus Christ, you have also accepted that you will forgive. Think about that. Can you, can you think about that for a sec? I'll accept you, Jesus, to forgive me, but I'm not forgiving nobody. And he's like, yeah, it doesn't quite work that way. In fact, the Bible says when Jesus went up on the cross, it tells us that we haven't suffered like Jesus suffered. We haven't been tortured for hours and hours and hours and then put up on a cross to bleed out and die in a torturous way. Whatever we have suffered does not equal what our Savior has suffered for us. Now, I do want to make... Uh, one thing really clear today as we close in just a few moments. I am not saying that you forgive ongoing abuse. You do not. If somebody is abusing you right now, you don't forgive them. You run in the opposite direction. You get away from them. You tell somebody, do not suffer alone. If somebody is abusing you, tell somebody there may be a little price to pay in the beginning but it's better than you staying in a place of abuse whatever that looks like and that's up to you to decide we can't just turn people in because they upset us but if there's actual abuse going on you absolutely must not stay in that abuse one more second and the trouble is oftentimes kind and sweet people who are being abused they will often say, well, it was my fault and I guess I just have to forgive them. And I want to empower you today, whether you're a male or a female, it's not your fault and you don't have to forgive them in the sense of allowing it to carry on. Once they're gone, we'll work on forgiveness. Come back and hear this message again. It'll all make sense. But it's really important, isn't it? That we don't allow people to just suffer because we misunderstand a message forgiveness is part of what your health as the scripture said as we began numerous studies have shown that holding on to grudges and unforgiveness leads to physical problems like stress related diseases heart high blood pressure heart problems and even death forgiveness can lead to improved mental and physical health. We know that for sure. And I'll close with this last scripture in Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23. Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. God wants your heart, your soul, to be whole. You will not be able to move on and move forward until you can let go of people that have had a hold over your life because of what they did to you. They might have left you, abandoned you, physically hurt you, emotionally hurt you. And here's the thing, you might be able to, if you can get to that point, understand that the people who were hurting you themselves 
we're already very broken people. People that are hurt are the ones that hurt others. You might have just been the closest, you know, the closest opportunity for somebody to lash out. Whether it was a family member or, 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 or a friend or somebody in your life, whoever it might have been, you just happened to be in the wrong spot. And you, got, you took the abuse, but now it's over. And you don't have to keep that in your heart and in your life. And you are not less because of what has happened to you. There are no labels that should be put upon you because of what happened to you. And I feel in my spirit to make this very clear to you. Do not label yourself due to what somebody has done to you. What was done to you is external. The freedom that comes through Jesus is internal. He washes us white as snow. The Bible says that he removes everything in our life. He removes our sins, everything that's happened, all of the hurt and the pain. He removes it as far as the east is from the west and he remembers it no more. If God can forget it, why can't you? Freedom is for you. It's not for everybody else. It's for you. Take it. Receive it. Know that it was paid for. And somebody didn't just write a check and it was easy. No, somebody was beaten and had almost every square inch of the skin beaten off their body. And then they were hauled up on the top of a hill and placed on the top of a rough cross. Nailed to the cross. Tortured until they died and all of the sin all of the terrible evil horrible things that humanity can do was laid upon him and his name is Jesus and that's why when we come to Jesus we come to that cross because at that cross that's where you leave it past the cross you don't have to carry what happened to you anymore you know what defines you now? It's not what happened to you in the past. You know what defines you now? It's who you are in Jesus Christ. You have a new identity. You have a new life. That's why Jesus said you must be born again. Because the old you died. Everything that happened to you died. That person doesn't exist anymore. There's a brand new you. Walk in that. Receive that. Know that God has turned everything around. And by the way, he plans to live with you forever. Not necessarily all those people that did whatever they did to you. Jesus chose you to live with you forever because he loves you that much.